Hello there. We're going to finish um, chapter four and uh, find out a little bit more about Mr. Badger. Presently, they all sat down to luncheon together. The mole found himself placed next to Mr. Badger and, as the other two were still deep in river gossip from which nothing could divert them, he took the opportunity to tell Badger how comfortable and homelike it all felt to him. Once well underground, he said, you know exactly where you are. Nothing can happen to you and nothing can get at you. You're entirely your own master and you don't have to consult anybody or mind what they say. Things go on all the same overhead, and you let them, and don't bother about them. When you want to, up you go, and there are there the things are, waiting for you. The badger simply beamed on him. That's exactly what I say, he replied. There's no security, or peace, and tranquillity, except underground. And then if your ideas get larger, if you want to expand, why a dig and a scrape and there you are. If you feel your house is a bit too big, you stop up a hole or two and there you are again. No builders, no tradesmen, no remarks passed on you by fellows looking over your wall and above all, no weather. Look at rat now. A couple of feet of flood water and he's got to move into hired lodgings. Uncomfortable, inconveniently situated and horribly expensive. Take Toad, I say nothing against Toad Hall, quite the best house in these parts. As a house, but supposing a fire breaks out, where's Toad? Supposing towels are blown off, or walls sink or crack, or windows get broken, where's Toad? Supposing the rooms are drafty, I hate a draft myself, where's Toad? No, up and about of doors is good enough to roam about and get one's living in, but underground to come back to at last, that's my idea of home. The mole assented heartily, and the badger, in consequence, got very friendly with him. When lunch is over, he said, I'll take you all around this little place of mine. I can see you'll appreciate it. You understand what domestic architecture ought to be, you do. After luncheon, accordingly, when the other two had settled themselves in the chimney corner and had started a heated argument about the subject of eels, the badger lighted a lantern and bade the mole follow him. Crossing the hall, they passed down one of the principal tunnels, and the wavering light of the lantern gave glimpses on either side of rooms both large and small, some mere cupboards, others nearly as broad and imposing as Toad's dining hall. A narrow passage at right angles led them into another corridor, and here the same thing was repeated. The mole was staggered at the size, the extent, the ramifications of it all, at the length of the dim passages, the solid vaultings of the crammed store chambers, the masonry everywhere, the pillars, the arches, the pavements. How on earth, Badger, he said at last, did you find time and strength to do all this? It's astonishing. It would be astonishing indeed, said the Badger simply, if I had done it. But as a matter of fact, I did none of it, only cleaned out the passengers and chambers as far as I need, had need of them. There's lots more of it all around about. I see you don't understand and I must explain it to you. Well, very long ago, on the spot where the wild wood waves now, before ever it had planted itself and grown up to what it is now, there was a city, a city of people, you know. Here where we are standing they lived and walked and talked and slept and carried on their business. Here they stabled their horses and feasted. From here they rode out to fight or drove out to trade. They were a powerful people and rich and great builders. They built to last and they thought their city would last forever. But what has become of them all? asked the mole. Who can tell? said the badger. People come, they stay for a while, they flourish, they build, they go. It is the way, but we remain. There were badgers here, I've been told, long before that same city ever came to be, and now there are badgers here again. We're an enduring lot, and we may move out for a time, but we wait and are patient, and back we come, and so it will ever be. Well, and when they went at last, these people, said the mole, when they went, continued the badger, the strong winds and persistent rains took the matter in hand, patiently, ceaselessly, year after year. Perhaps we badgers too, in our small way, helped a little, who knows? It was all down, 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 gradually ruin and levelling and disappearance. Then it was all up, 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 gradually a seed grew to saplings, and saplings grew to forest trees, and bramble and fern came creeping in to help. Leaf mole rose and obliterated. Streams in the winter freshets brought sand and soil to clog and to cover, and in course of time our home was ready for us again. We moved in. Up above us on the surface the same thing happened. Animals arrived, liked the look of the place and took up their quarters, settled down, spread and flourished. They didn't bother themselves about the past. They never do. They're too busy. The place was a bit humpy and hillocky, hillocky. naturally, and full of holes. 
but that was rather an advantage. They didn't bother about the future either, the future when perhaps the people will move in again, for a time, as may very well be. The Wildwood is pretty well pop populated by now, with all the usual lot, good, bad and indifferent. I name no names. It takes all sorts to make a world, but I fancy you know something about them yourself by this time. I do indeed, said the Mole with a slight shiver. Well, well, said the Badger, patting him on the shoulder. It was your first experience of them, you see. They're not so bad, really. We must all live and let live. But I'll pass the word around tomorrow, and I think you'll have no further trouble. Any friend of mine walks where he likes in this country, or I'll know the reason why. When they got back down into the kitchen again, they found Rat walking up and down, very restless. The underground atmosphere was oppressing him and getting on his nerves. He seemed really to be afraid that the river would run away if he wasn't there to look after it. So he had his overcoat on and his pistols thrust into his belt again. Come along, Mole, he said anxiously as soon as he caught sight of them. We must get off while it's daylight. Don't want to spend another night in the wild wood again. It'll be all right, my fine fellow, said the otter. I'm coming along with you and I know every path blindfolded. And if there's a head that needs punched, you can confidently rely on me to punch it. You really needn't fret, Ratty, said the badger placidly. My, passenger, my passengers run further than you think. I've got bolt holes to the edge of the wood in several directions, though I don't care for everyone to know about them. When you really have to go, you shall leave by one of my shortcuts. Meantime, make yourselves easy. Sit down again. The rat was nevertheless still anxious to be off and, attended to, and attend to his river, so the badger, taking up his lantern again, led the way along a damp and airless tunnel that wound and dipped, part faltered, part hewn through solid rock, for a weary distance that seemed to be miles. At last daylight began to show itself confusedly through a tangled growth overhanging the mouth of the passage, and the badger, bidding them a hasty goodbye, pushed them hurriedly through the opening, made everything look as natural as possible again with creepers and brushwood and dead leaves, and retreated. They found themselves standing on the very edge of the wild wood, rocks and brambles and tree roots behind them, confusedly heaped and tangled. In front, a great space of quiet fields, hemmed by lines of hedges, black on the snow, and far ahead a glint of the familiar old river, while the wintry sun rung hung red and low on the horizon. The otter, as knowing all the paths, took charge of the party, and they trailed out on a bee-line for some distant style. Pausing there a moment and looking back, they saw the whole mass of the wild wood, dense, menacing, compact, grimly set in vast white surroundings. Simultaneously they turned and made swiftly for home, for firelight and for the familiar things it played on, for the voice, sounding cheerily outside their window, of the river that they knew and trusted in all its moods, and that never made them afraid with any amazement. As he hurried along, eagerly anticipating the moment when he would be at home again among the things he knew and liked, the Mole saw clearly that he was an animal of tilled field and hedgerow, linked to the ploughed furrow, the frequented pasture, the lane of evening lingerings, the cultivated garden plot. Further, the asperities, the stubborn endurance of this clash of actual conflict and that went with nature in the rough, he must be wise and must keep to the pleasant places in which the lines were laid, which adventure enough, and that, which held adventure enough in their way to last a lifetime. Right, guys, that's the end of chapter four. Uh, hope you're keeping safe, keeping well, and keeping reading. See you soon for chapter five.